Okay, okay, so we're ready to start. Are we online? We're online. Perfect, so uh, apologies uh, that we're a little bit late, uh, but fortunately we'll make up for it with, uh, with the content. Uh, a little bit um, uh, about the brief history of this event. 
Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, who are we? We are um, SMB, uh, Science Means Business. We're non-profit organizations, uh, organization, and what do we do? We organize events, mostly, uh, based in Leiden to facilitate exchange of ideas, knowledge, uh, between scientists based in Leiden, scientists from academia, scientists from small companies, big companies, all scientists based in Leiden. So, and um, this event um, we're doing together with uh, Rijksmuseum Burhave, where we're all based, and with the initiative with the Leiden 2022 uh, City of Science. So, as you probably already know, Leiden uh, won this um, honor to be a City of Science in 2022, and every day is dedicated to a certain topic. And um, I think uh, it's very m the history of this event is very much in line with, the, with uh, how science is being done, I think. So it starts with, uh, with the idea. We uh, got this idea to do an event in March because we hoped it would be possible. And uh, as uh, we asked in 2022, so which topics are still open, which days are still free, and then the day of kidneys was there. And then we thought, cool, kidneys are interesting, let's try. And then it's like, oh, there is an artificial kidney in, uh, in the Bojave Museum, this one. Uh, and, oh, this one, there's one other over there. And then uh, we thought, oh, but there's also Dutch Kidney Foundation, uh, with, with, which we can invite to collaborate. And then we can also, um, I re realized that I was doing PhD next to the Department of Nephrology. So basically all these uh, ideas and uh, improvisation uh, helped us organize in this rather big event in a very short amount of time and um, yeah I hope you will like it and um, again welcome uh, to all of you on behalf of uh, Leiden 2022, Rex Museum Burhawe and Science Miss Business and I would like to introduce our first speaker so we'll, today we'll go about uh, through the history and science of artificial kidney from past to present and future and of course we we'll start with the past and with the Hermann Kolf uh, the inventor of the first artificial kidney, but of course I um, will give an opportunity to tell more about it to our first speaker, to Bart. Bart, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Let me open my presentation. Do it like this. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, first, for uh, the invitation. Uh, although you might uh, would have expected Herman Broers, but uh, unfortunately um, he got uh, uh, he felt ill, and um, and Herman and I know each other for many years, so he entrusted me with replacing uh, him. Um, I'm a curator here in uh, in the museum, and. Um, I um, would like to tell you more about uh, Willem Kolf, his work and his uh, inventions. And the title uh, of my, uh, my presentation um, was inspired by you all, because in my opinion, and uh, that's what I, uh, uh, what I like uh, about presenting uh, this presentation to you, because um, your thinkers do as adventurers. And that's what you have in common with uh, the hero um, uh, of tonight, um, Willem, uh, Willem Kolf. And the story starts here in Kampen in the 1940s. Um, and what you see here is the city hospital where a very young uh, Kolf, uh, let me see, is this. I always um, am a little bit afraid to touch these buttons because before you know you're flipping slides. Um, Willem Kolf here uh, uh, on his photo uh, with uh, some of uh, uh, the nurses uh, in his team. Um, it's an interesting photo, um, like I said, taken in the, um, uh, this one is taken in the, uh, uh, the early, uh, early 50s. And Colum uh, was so proud of his team, his team members, uh, so that he, uh, he posed with uh, nurses, and not only with uh, his scientific uh, staff. Um, in 
1943, no, 19, uh, 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 some years earlier, uh, Koloff was working as a doctor physician, general physician, uh, in, uh, in uh, the city hospital in, uh, in Kampen. And he uh, was shocked by one of his patients, um, a young farmer um, in his 20s, if I uh, remember it correctly, um, died under his hands of sudden kidney failure. And he thought, well, I have to find a solution for this. So he um, came up with this idea to invent an artificial kidney. And I have included this photo uh, for the people who are watching at home uh, because they probably can't see the, um, the model itself, which I have uh, here. Luckily, we have two of them. The original uh, and the oldest one is on display, on permanent display, in the museum. And here we have a later version, but it functions exactly uh, the same. Um, if you were expecting Victor Mitz, Mitz and doing um, a, a fabulous show, I have to disappoint you. I'm not going to do a trick here, but I need these gloves because then I can touch this artificial kidney. This is the model uh, Kolf uh, invented, and I will show it uh, to you. And what you can't see in the museum is a three-dimensional view. Uh, I will turn it around and I will explain some of the parts uh, later. But first of all, I, want, I have a question for you. How many of you are developing machines? Please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Then you know um, how important it is that you design your uh, apparatus, uh, apparatus or machines, that you, that you design them well, that, that the user uh, can use them very intuitively, for example. Um, and one of the amazing things I just showed you is this. I will show it again. <laughs> it's this. It seems very ordinary, uh, but uh, Koloff uh, immediately designed um, his artificial kidney with wheels, which means that you can place it um, near the bedside. Here you see some examples of it. And it's, 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 it's really amazing because um, only 10, 15 years um, uh, later than the X-ray uh, machines became widely available in, uh, in hospitals, it was at, that, at the same time that if, you, um, if patients uh, needed, to be, needed to take um, an X-ray uh, photograph, they were uh, transported to uh, the special department where, they, where you could uh, take an X-ray. Kolov designed his machine uh, so that it could place near uh, the patient. So an early, very, very early um, example of bedside uh, medicine. So <clears throat> how, how does this machine actually work? I will show you. What you, probably the most striking part of the instrument is this part. And um, I think we're all not old enough to have, to have uh, experienced it itself, but this resembles um, an early type of washing machine from the 20s, 30s, uh, probably. And around, and this washing machine, this, 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 this column is placed in a bath of um, rinsing uh, fluid. 
um, which is uh, uh, connected to, to a very uh, funny story. The, when, when this column was, um, when this drum was uh, spinning around, it would um, cause a lot of uh, water splashing, fluid splashing, and a lot of foam. Um, so the nurses you saw on the, on the photograph were the only uh, nurses allowed to uh, walk on clocks because otherwise their feet would be, uh, would be wet all the time. Um, what you see here, oh no, so the, um, the original uh, instrument, or the, 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 the first generation, um, was constructed in the 1940s, uh, 43, the first prototype was, uh, was ready. And Kolov had to reuse or use materials that he could, his, uh, uh, that he could lay his hands on. So um, this is um, made by an Imai uh, uh, factory, but his original model uh, upstairs, uh, this, how you call it, container, uh, was constructed by um, aluminium plates taken from a gunned down German bomber. <clears throat> what um, uh, they use, uh, that there should be an engine over here. Uh, you can see it, see it somewhere there. Um, the engine he used was an engine of a sewing machine. He, didn't, he couldn't buy any other engines, so he had to use the sewing, sewing machine. Um, this is um, uh, uh, the, the chain, is that the correct word? How, when, you, when you drive um, um, a belt, sorry, that's what I was looking, what, looking for. The belt he took from an old um, um, moped. And one of the uh, issues he had uh, was with the foil. Um, I always explain it to children, well, this is a tube that you flatten, and that's where the blood runs through. Um, and you can, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, produced by um, uh, specialized uh, suppliers, medical suppliers uh, back then, already in the 40s, but in 1943, he had to rely on the local butcher because he used the same um, intestines uh, where the butcher would make uh, sausages uh, from. It has the same semic permeability um, uh, features as uh, um, the usual material he used. So this drum is spinning around. Here, as you can see, it's so much fun to finally turn it around and show it. Let's take advantage of it. Um, this is where the patient uh, blood runs uh, through. It's connected with, um, uh, with the vein of the, of the patient. I will show you to the other side as well. Here you are. So here is where uh, the connection between the machine and the patient is made. Um, and in the original, you will see that um, the blood uh, on the other end comes, runs through this connection. I will show you through this connection. That's interesting, uh, because <clears throat> if you spin this around to make the drum go around, and you have a connection with um, a tube, what will happen to the tube? It will be twisted. So he used, because he had nothing else uh, he, could, uh, he could find, he used a, a part of um, a T Ford engine. In Dutch, it's called uh, a spruit, uh, spuitstuk. 
I don't know what the English uh, word for it is. But um, it's, a, um, um, it's a piece uh, that um, works in such a way that it can spin, but the, other, uh, the inner part uh, is held in its place. Rotary joint. A rotary joint. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> in short, um, the function of the, um, of the first uh, s type of artificial uh, kidney. Um, after the uh, Second World War, um, Koloff immigrated to the United States. And one of the reasons was that he thought, well, the, um, uh, I'm a venturer and the climate uh, uh, the scientific climate, but also uh, the entrepreneurial uh, climate here in the Netherlands. It's they, they, people around me, they think too small. I want to think bigger. And that's what he did. Um, went to, uh, to Utah, and in Utah he invented uh, the artificial heart. And that's what you see here. And it's amazing because uh, uh, Koloff this, that doesn't seem to uh, grow any any older. You know, this is this is taken from uh, what is it the, the, the 60s. This is an um, uh, artificial heart uh, uh, later called the Jarvik uh, model because it was named after the surgeon that implanted the first artificial heart. I remember it still as as, um, as a kid. I think I was eight, nine years old in eight, uh, 1980, and it was world news. Um, Barney Clark received as the first person in the world um, the heart invented and imagined by uh, Willem Koloff. But after 120 hours, uh, Barney Clark died uh, as, as a result of complications. And then shit hit the fan. Because um, Koloff found himself in a storm uh, of all uh, uh, kinds of, 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 of ethical questions. And luckily for him, I think, um, social media was not uh, invented yet. Uh, but even, uh, even without social media, uh, the uh, uh, talk shows were talking about um, whether Pim Kolf, um wasn't a new Dr. Frankenstein. Did medicine and the advancement of medicine um, bumped into a red line that we shouldn't cross? Luckily uh, for uh, Kolf and, and uh, his team, and, and I think the advancement in medicine as, uh, in general, uh, this team was, was uh, uh, they, they just kept to themselves and said, okay, we have to, we have to do this um, because we're doing a good job. And colleagues, uh, near, the nearest colleagues um, uh, around, uh, uh, surrounding, surrounding Kolov, they, um, they came up with uh, a joke they told each other to keep themselves motivated. And the joke was as follows. Um, uh, Jarvik came to, uh, to Pim, Pim Kolf, um, and uh, asked Pim, well, Pim, do you know what St. Peter asked Barney when he knocked on heaven's door? And Pim Kolf said, I have no idea. St. Peter said, Barney, you're 120 hours late. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and I find it, I find it as, a, as a curator um, uh, and, 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 and an enthusiast about these, these uh, uh, developments and these technologies, um, I'm really impressed by um, the mindset uh, a person like uh, Kolf uh, has. Um, because Kolf didn't stop with inventing the artificial uh, heart. He also um, tried to make 
this model, the artificial kidney, uh, into um, um, uh, make it carryable. And there is a small, very rare footage of um, a prototype which was introduced during the uh, Korean War in the US, uh, US Army, uh, where one of the uh, soldiers uh, were, uh, is, is, is carrying um, a portable uh, kidney. Um, and here you see him um, with a portable oxygen, uh, whoop, oxygenator, sorry, it's a little bit of a tongue uh, twister, when he was already in his 90s. Um, Koloff retired three times. <laughs> Once when he was, uh, when he was uh, 65, the second time in 1987, when he was already in his 80s, and then his wife divorced him after 62 years of marriage. 62 years of marriage. She divorced him, uh, and the reason was, I always came second place, and you promised me already that you would retire, and now you're going back to work again. So that was in 1987. Um, he, uh, he, he, he thought he would retire, but he um, um, uh, was already, like I said, was already in his 80s, went to this uh, elderly care uh, home, set up office, and started working again. <laughs> and the thir third time he retired, he was completely uh, blind, completely deaf, and it was 2005. That was the last time he uh, retired. And he, um, he passed away in 2009, uh, three days before uh, his 98th birthday. So <clears throat> this is the, um, uh, the end and concluding uh, uh, remarks on, my, uh, on the life of uh, Pim Kolf and his, uh, and his machine. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you, are as, uh, you are as inspired as I am about this amazing inventor, thinker, doer, adventurer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. Really inspiring story. And I'm sure that there are already uh, questions popping up. So we have both questions from the, ch from the chat and from the audience. Uh, I think we can start with the audience. And uh, just to warn you, you have to keep your questions short because I will repeat them. So if you have asked a question for four minutes, I will repeat them for four minutes and probably forget everything you said. So uh, yes, pl please. Yeah, thanks. So uh, for the online audience, I'm repeating the question. So the question is basically, how does the machine actually work? Maybe we can put on the slide with the, uh, with that. the machine as well. Yeah. Uh, so how does it work from a mechanical perspective and from a biochemical perspective, right? Did I understand the question correctly? Right. Um, I didn't practice on the um, uh, biochemical uh, English th uh, terms. Um, so forgive me if I am um, uh, misusing uh, the correct or not using the correct terms. Right. Um, the mechanical part um, is this is a rotating drum. So the blood flows from this tube from the patient through the filter. And the filter, the urea uh, molecules, are filtered out of uh, the blood because of the um, osmosis uh, of the fluid, uh, the rinsing. I call it the rinsing fluid in, um, uh, in English. Uh, so the, the, the blood is filtered and then via this uh, part it is again uh, transported into the patient. But 
imagine that the whole process would take seven to 14 hours a day. And nowadays, the, and that's, that's, uh, that's um, uh, to keep in mind, um, um, uh, kidney dialysis, dialysis is uh, still used as treatment uh, today, and uh, these uh, uh, kidneys are, are small like this. But the, um, uh, the, 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 the content uh, of, of, of these kidneys is, I think, and I'm looking for uh, the real specialist, uh, uh, has, has been enlarged 2,000 times, 200 times, something like that. Uh, so um, uh, you, you, you need uh, less hours to, um, to dialyze today. And it's interesting, I, di I didn't mention, but, but, um, because I was looking at, um, at my time, um, Kolf was also um, a prominent member of the Dutch resistance in, uh, in the Second World War. And um, uh, during, the, uh, this, the, uh, the, the, during wartime, uh, he was not immediately successful in treating uh, patients. Um, he tried uh, uh, this technology on 16, 16 uh, patients who unfortunately uh, uh, died. Um, but I have to say, this was the only, the last uh, resort they, uh, they had. And in 1946, uh, he, uh, he managed to save a patient's um, life, uh, a woman. Um, who was a well-known member of the NSB. And that's also something I always tell in, uh, uh, when, I, when I'm doing a, a tour, is um, uh, how uh, much empathy uh, Kolf must have had. But you need your, the rest of your life uh, at this machine, but yep. you can So the question was to, to whether you need to continue using it for the rest of your life, and that is indeed the case as yep. with dialysis today as well. Yep. Any other questions? Yes? Why do we need gloves? Uh, why I need is, gloves? The question is why the speaker needed gloves for his presentation. <laughs> it's for the show. No. <laughs> no, um, uh, there is, there is uh, acid on, uh, on, my, on sweaty hands. Uh, and if I put on gloves, uh, this uh, acid uh, will not uh, eat the lacquer, for example. So it's pure uh, protection for uh, metallic uh, objects. And uh, my head of um, uh, collections might be watching uh, via the, <laughs> the stream. So if I, if I don't put on my gloves, I'm, I'm in trouble, Monet. Maybe another burning question? Or from the chat? Because you said that he was doer, inventor, thinker, but can you comment a little bit about his background, education? So, so the question was about uh, <coughs> Willem Kolf's uh, education it. and background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he uh, was trained as a, um, uh, he studied medicine uh, here, in, uh, here in Leiden uh, and did his uh, PhD. Uh, as well uh, in Leiden. I'm, I'm sorry I forgot what uh, the subject uh, was. Um, and um, he got married uh, soon after his PhD. And what, for what I understood is that um, because he and his, 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 his uh, young family uh, needed income, and that's the, probably uh, the reason why he took up his job in Kampen. Um, and in uh, Kampen, he, um, as a doer, he uh, developed this, uh, this instrument. Um, and after, uh, uh, yeah, after the Second World War, he moved to uh, immigrated to uh, to America, where he got in touch with uh, other bright minds and thinkers and doers and venturers, um, 
And there's an interesting, um, uh, I call it an interesting story about um, Kolf and one of his assistants, because when you when you when the uh, blood runs through um, uh, through this 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 hose, uh, the blood is also oct uh, oxygenated. And um, one of his ass assistants uh, saw uh, the blood changing color into oxygen poor, into oxygen rich uh, blood. And um, he, his assistant um, uh, suddenly mentioned like, wow, with this machine, patients can breathe through their kidneys. And that's 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 an interesting interesting find, and that's how he got involved in um, uh, inventing uh, the oxygenator and and as a as a step towards the um, development of the artificial heart. I think we have to. Yeah, I think we need to. We will have a drink session afterwards, so you, uh, you can definitely discuss it uh, further. And uh, with this, I think we would like to give another round of applause to Bart for this brilliant, brilliant presentation. <laughs> and with closing, we're also moving from the past to the present. Uh, obviously, we learned that Willem Kolf was quite a giant. So who okay. is standing on the shoulder of this giant? Uh, and that will be told by Jasper Bomker, the program manager in Nier Stichting Nederland. Floor is yours. I would like to thank uh, the first speaker for your excellent presentation. Okay, yeah. For the audience at home. Okay, uh, so I will stay behind the cabinet here, so I will not move. Um, so you now all have heard about how dialysis works. And I was asked to give you a presentation on how dialysis works today. Um, I'm not a doctor, I have to say, I'm also not a kidney patient, so I have nothing to do with dialysis except for the fact that I work for the Dutch Kidney Foundation. I'm, I'm a program manager there, and I'm involved in various projects on dialysis innovation. So dialysis does have my interest. Um, so uh, I hope to enlighten you to tonight, to this evening, with my view on, on how dialysis is today. And I also give you, give you the floor from two patients to you about how they experience dialysis. Um, well, this is dialysis in 2022. And I don't have to explain to you the machine because it works exactly as, as, as what the first speaker has told you. The principle of hemodialysis is still the same. It's all diffusion osmosis over a semi-permeable membrane. It's not a sausage skin like Kolf used, but it's a plastic, it's a polysulfone membrane. It's a disposable which is on the side of the big machine that you see here. Um, and also, um, well, not, not much has changed except for, the, for maybe the, the, the look of the machine and the automation, but still the nurses still wear clocks uh, nowadays. Um, um, but I think it's, it, when I started in this, in this field, I thought of dialysis, I, I learned about blood purification and it sounded like a wellness treatment. So I thought that's, a, that's very nice. But, but when, when you speak to patients, it's certainly not a wellness treatment because patients do not feel very well when they come off from the kidney, from the, the artificial kidney. Uh, I will explain you later. Let's look at dialysis, how it is today. I think dialysis is saving the lives today of two and a half million patients in this world. For this, they need to go three times a week to the hospital, to a specialized center to go on dialysis, to be connected to a machine for three to four hours. In that time frame, 72 liters of blood is purified by the machine, and that's just enough for people to stay alive. 
So this means that you have actually one million treatments a day. So think of it, what the impact is of, doctor, of well, Dr. Kolf's invention nowadays. Um, also, dialysis has become a business. You can earn a lot of money by doing dialysis. I think that the, the market size of only the machines is 16 billion euros. Uh, and it's still growing because there's lots of parts in the world where there's no dialysis. Um, so it's, um, uh, you could say that with the invention that Kolf did with the artificial kidney, we may have conquered kidney disease. But I must admit that that's not really true. I would say it's a Pyrrhic victory. It's like uh, King Pyrrhic of Epirus, who conquered Rome two, maybe three centuries before Christ. He took 20 elephants with him and 10,000 men, and he was conquering the Romans. And the first battles he won, and the second battle he won. But in the end, he lost the war, because the Romans are still in Italy. Um, and I think that's the same with dialysis. I think it's the treatment itself is a success, but still patients are not being brought back to the original life. So there's a few things I want to say about dialysis. It's an expensive treatment. I think in the Netherlands we pay about 90 to 100,000 euros per year for a kidney patient on dialysis. We can afford that, but there are lots of parts in the world where people cannot simply afford dialysis. So this means that two thirds of the world, two thirds of the people in need for a kidney replacement therapy will not get it because of costs. And well, and I think that feels like kind of injustice because well, inequality of access to health is really injustice. Also, current dialysis is, is only um, doing parts of the work. Bear in mind that patients who are on dialysis nowadays have a worse survival chance than people with colon cancer, for instance, and actually like most types of cancers. Um, so when you look at the numbers, that is still, after all these years, after all these years of, of inventions, it's still a, a grim outcome for people. And, and what's then the reason for patients to stop dialysis? Well, one big reason is because they die, because of heart failure. Um, and this heart failure is related to the fact that the the kidney treatment, the dialysis, is not replacing all kidney functions. It only replaces 10 to 15% of the native kidneys. So it's really just enough to stay alive. Also, the intermittency of the treatment, the fact that you can only do it three times a week for four hours, is a burden on the heart. Because you go on dialysis, you have drank the last two days, you're filled with salts and fluids, and you go on the machine, and within four hours, whoosh, you're drained. Um, so people really have a hangover when they go on dialysis. And this three times a week, it's not very healthy for you. Uh, and also there are a lot of compounds that cannot be removed, that are still in your blood, but cannot be removed by the artificial kidney. And, and this whole plethora of effects, actually what the kidney does not, is, uh, is causing arrhythmias, is causing cardiac overload. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why patients die. There is, of course, a trick that you can do, and that's not dialyzing three times a week, but dialyzing more often and maybe shorter. So um, I would compare it with a harmonica, like what you do with regular dialysis is pulling it and then. But if you do it shortly, it's more easy to do, and it's less of a burden for the heart. But of course, it's difficult to dialyze every day um, because you need to have a vascular connection every day. Actually, that was, one, that was the invention between Kolf and dialysis now, is that we needed an, a vascular access. And that was not invented by the time of Kolf. So Kolf could use his machine only a couple of times for one patient. And with the invention of a vascular access, which was a surgical, surgical connection between a, an artery and a, and a vein in the arm, uh, you could generate a high blood flow and you could cannulate the vein that was dilated now due to the high blood flows. Um, and, and with this trick, uh, the seminotient, uh, um, uh, people could be continuously on dialysis. So that was the advent of chronic dialysis, which started actually in the early 60s. Um, but back to this, uh, this picture, I want to show to you that your survival rate can increase by dialyzing more often or taking more time for your dialysis. So that's something that you can remember. The other reason why people stop dialysis mm -hmm. is withdrawal. This is voluntary withdrawal. So a significant part of the patients decide not to continue dialysis in the end. It's also because of high age, uh, but also the dialysis treatment is, 
is posing a, a heavy burden on, this, on, on the well-being of these patients. So 17% of patients, I have to say these are numbers from the United States, in the United States 17% of patients decide voluntarily to quit dialysis, which means that they will die within a couple of weeks. Um, so what you can do, how to combine the burden of dialysis, going to the hospital, granulating every day with uh, uh, frequent dialysis, which I told you was maybe better. Well, that's of course home dialysis, doing your treatment in the vicinity of the patient, doing your treatment at home. And um, um, doing home dialysis gives you maybe more time on dialysis. People do, do it sometimes during sleep. Uh, so they have this big machine next to the bed. Here you see a picture of uh, Fabian. Fabian is our, our patient that we use often in campaigns for the Dutch Kidney Foundation. But he's a true dialysis patient. He's now transplanted, by the way. But um, he was doing nighttime dialysis uh, at home. And he had this very big machine at home. Um, and, and, and when you look in the houses of people who are doing home dialysis, they only, do not only have the machine, they also have a water purification system at the, in the other room because it's making noise. Why a water purification system? Well, for an average treatment, you still need 100 or 120 liters of ultra-pure blood, uh, blood uh, fluids, water, uh, salts. Um, so this is something that you need to generate at home. Uh, you also have a lot of disposables, uh, 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 and, and, and you have to learn to cannulate yourself, or you have to ask a nurse to come to your house and connect you to the machine. Um, you have to do some troubleshooting. So there is uh, still a lot of pioneering in home dialysis, I have to say. And I think I, I, know, I know a couple of patients who are doing home dialysis, and, and they are really motivated to do them th themselves because it gives them more freedom. They tell me, I'm on dialysis five or six days a week. I'm doing five, six times, eight hours in the night, and I feel very well. And, and what I hate to do is to go on holiday with my family. Because when I go on holiday to Spain or so, I have to go back to the center, to a hospital, go back to three times dialysis. And I'm feeling ill three weeks, but my family is on the beach and having fun. Um, and I think it's worth it. Um, I told you I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Dutch Kidney Foundation, and, and we often uh, speak a lot with patients. Or we also deal a lot with the Kidney Patient Association. Uh, they are in our office, so we are more or less one organization. And um, uh, we, are, we are focusing on innovation for dialysis because we think that the innovation has, has been not enough over the last decades. I think it ended in, its, in the 60s with the invention of the machine that you saw. Um, but, but we think if you compare it maybe to diabetes care or to heart care, that if you look at kidney care, it's still the same. People still have to go three times a week to a hospital. And, and we think that, that by that time, with everything we know about technology, we think that we could do better. Um, so we were asking patients to, 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 to ask us, well, how do you experience your dialysis and, and what do you expect from innovation? Uh, and this is always tricky because it's a video and I don't know, I haven't tested it, but I will try if it works. And um, um, it's actually two patients that I asked. Uh, one is uh, Henning from Denmark and William from the UK. And, and they're telling their story. It's a three minute movie. And uh, um, let's see. There it is. And I hope also the sound works. Nope. I think the biggest effect kidney disorder has had on my life is the fact that I was used to traveling quite a bit. Um, I mean, I used to be on the road more than I was in my home. And, and that is impossible now. <laughs> My name is Henning Sundergaard, and I work as a psychologist for the Danish Kidney Association. My name is William. I live in the UK. Uh, I'm a dialysis patient, been on dialysis for 27 years, and it had a, a, an impact on me mentally at, at the age of 19. Um, and a lot of other people on dialysis were older, so it was harder for me as a young person wanting to work uh, and, and go to university and those things that most normal people do at that age. I, I uh, struggled and wasn't really able to do the things that I would have normally have done. They're basically still the same technology as they were 50 years ago, which is, is 
horrible. I mean, it's it's it I, it blows my mind that that can happen. And usually, what I say is, if the if the innovation in consumer electronics had been like the innovations in dialysis machines, my laptop or my phone, for that matter, would be the size of four New York City blocks. I think any innovation should try and balance clinical need and quality of life so that people don't have to compromise so much. I think the most important thing we can do in order to further innovation in renal replacement therapy is start working together. I think everyone should try and be open-minded uh, about uh, other people's opinions and perhaps patients' opinions. Ten years earlier, I'd given up my hobby, which was uh, I'm a drummer. I play in. A, I used to play in a band. And I combined my camper van with playing in a band to go uh, to France uh, for eight days a few years ago. And we played uh, around northern France. Being able to um, do something I enjoy again that my disease stopped me from doing was 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 quite a big change. A dream come true. <laughs> So that is the story of Henning and of uh, William. Um, when you ask doctors what could a good kid, how does a good kidney treatment look like, and when you ask patients what does a good kidney treatment look like, they come up with different things. And this is an international study. Uh, I must say that I did, well, there were no Dutch doctors involved. Um, I, I think they would do better. But what, what they say is actually that doctors are usually rating, of course, the clinical outcomes, the technical outcomes, of course, very high. Whereas patients also find important, I would say, the simple things like being able to travel with your device or, uh, or maybe the time spent on dialysis. And these are two things that are, well, not so well highly rated by doctors. Uh, and I think we are... We are now in a movement where there is a kind of shared decision making and there's much more dialogue between patients and doctors. So I think we are, we are catching up, um, uh, but it's good to be aware that this could be a factor in the, in, well, that could explain why innovation has not very much involved in the last decade because, well, it maybe was more driven by the needs of the doctors rather than the needs of the patients. Kolf, by the way, he, he was working on a small artificial kidney, a portable artificial kidney. I think the first speaker referred to it. And this is a picture of Kolf showing his artificial kidney at, uh, at, at the Congress of the Dutch Kidney Foundation in 1977. He published this portable wearable artificial kidney, he called it. Um, and this was, this was portable because it didn't use 120 liters of water, but he he included a purification system in it. So he was recycling the dialysate, yeah, the, the water solution that you use to rinse the blood, and he was recycling it over a charcoal filter. This was 1976, so it's almost 46 years ago. Bear in mind. Um, so what's happening? Why is there an innovation deadlock? And, and I think, this is my personal view, is that, that it, well, I think the reason why we can dialyze two and a half million people in the world is because dialysis is a business, but I think it's also the reason why there is not so much innovation. Because there is no really real incentive to change. There are whole parts of the world that still need dialysis. And, and so the focus is on maybe bringing more of the same to these parts of the world. And maybe the doctor's perception is that, of course, transplantation is the best thing that you can do. So if you have money, why invest in a kind of poor treatment like dialysis, better maybe invest in making available more organs. And also maybe innovators' perception is that there is not so much that you can think of that could do better than dialysis. I think dialysis does all. It removes toxins, it removes water, it regulates your electrolyte content, all in one system. Um, 
also the regulations for market access and that technological standards are nowadays very high. I think it's now unthinkable that you could do a clinical trial where the first 18 patients died. Um, and I'm not talking about the cost because the average cost for making a medical device is $100 million nowadays. Um, and also, we are used to doing dialysis. So it's difficult to make a kind of new care concept for this dialysis. So the trick is that we need to think about a whole new ecosystem that it's needed to make innovations for patients. And it starts, of course, with asking patients what they need. And then discuss with inventors, with, with technology guys, engineers, on what can we think of? How can we do this? So maybe reinvent dialysis like Kolf did. And then talk to doctors like, what do you think that this machine should do? And how should it work? Um, ask uh, uh, notified bodies. So uh, uh, organizations that do the certification, that give you market access, that decide on what are the safety aspects, what, what kind of tests do you need to do to get a medical device on the market? I think you need to talk to them as well. Because what engineers and what doctors think is safe is maybe different than what a patient thinks is safe. Um, and then, of course, you need to talk to industry. How, what incentive do you need to change your business model? Um, so this is kind of whole circle that we tried to go through in the last couple of years at the Dutch Kidney Foundation. We were very much aware of this uh, complex ecosystem. And of course, we are only Kidney Foundation. We're raising money and we're giving money to, to researchers. But we want to make a step further and we say, OK, we have hospital dialysis. We have a small group of patients, only 5%, who is doing hospital dialysis at home. It's called home dialysis. And we thought we should change this concept. We would get rid of this 100 liters of water. We should get rid of the, of the power supply that you would need to do dialysis at home. We need a, a kidney in a suitcase, like Kolf did in, 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 the, in, the, in the 70s. So it's kind of bring your own dialysis. So we started with, uh, with talking to uh, a few companies in, uh, in Switzerland and in Singapore. And they were also working on new dialysis machines. So we made an agreement that we should work together. We also involved uh, not only the Dutch Kidney Foundation, but also our healthcare insurance, because they are the ones who pay every year almost 100,000 euros for each patient. So we say, if we can think of, th think of something better that works better and brings people at home, it will save you money. So you better pay now. Well, luckily they did. Um, we, we are dealing with universities, University in Utrecht. We did some first clinical tests. We also talked to patients, of course, about how should this device look like. And last year, we, we made a prototype device working on six liters of fluids. It, this is what we call a portable artificial kidney. We had some discussions whether we should call this portable because it fits in a suitcase, but it doesn't, it's not something that you wear on your body. Um, this is something that patients explicitly excluded this option. So I don't want to have a device on my, on my back the whole day. Um, so we gave them this portable artificial kidney thing. We are now in the process also here in the Netherlands, talking to care organizations, talking to healthcare insurers, talking to patients, to healthcare professionals, on if we have this device within a couple of years, how do we need to change care concept? We need a kind of new nurse. Uh, 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 and so people probably, well, not all patients can do it themselves. So we need to think about which nurses can go to the homes of these patients to help them. How do we do the logistics? And what is the maximum cost? Um, this is something that we as a Dutch Kidney Foundation started, but, but actually this is also something uh, that we do with the nephrologist, with the nurses, and also with the kidney patients. Internationally, there is the same movement. Uh, actually, in the United States, it was noticed that there was not so much clinical kidney trials. And when you look at, at the database of clinical trials, you will find very few trials for kidney patients. And this was noticed by the FDA the FDA, the, 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 the organization that is giving market access to medical devices, they even noticed that there is not so much improvement in the treatments over the last decades. And they decided we should stick together, we should, we should make a consortium with companies, with the FDA, we, we should start a patient council um, and make an international movement, which is called the Kidney Health Initiative, maybe to speed up this innovation process, to, so to improve the innovation ecosystem. And we helped them writing a technology roadmap, uh, and which we also now apply for our own research, 
What they did in the United States, and this is the step that we unfortunately did not take, is they reserved uh, 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 60 millions of dollars uh, for a research program, which is not so very much, I have to say, for the United States, but at least it's a start. So there is a, now a dedicated funding program for innovations for dialysis. It's called the, uh, the Kidney X, the Kidney Accelerator, and our focus is now that we want to do the same trick here in the European Union. Not only in the Netherlands, but we should do this as a European Union. So this is what we are doing. We are now, our focus is now on the portable artificial kidney, but of course uh, our vision is, is that we have this, if we have this artificial kidney, we may, uh, have, we may be able to generate some more funding from investors to do all the other kinds of innovations, like for the vascular access, um, maybe for further miniaturizations of the system, for making smart sensors, uh, only to improve portable dialysis. And of course, our ultimate solution would be an implantable biological artificial kidney, a bioengineered kidney. This is, of course, this is our dream. And, um, um, but I'll leave it up for the, for the speaker next uh, after me uh, to talk about bioengineering. Uh, I only want to mention that a couple of years we started a big initiative together with um, the, the Heart Foundation and with the Diabetes Foundation and the Diabetes Research Foundation and the, uh, the Rheumatoid Arthritis uh, Foundation, we took the initiative to make a joint institute where also the University of Leiden is involved and Utrecht, Maastricht, Eindhoven and Leuven and 20 companies, um, uh, as well as the, uh, the local authorities, also the Gemeente Leiden is part of it, um, and say we should work together making new therapies, regenerative therapies, because that's our ultimate dream. We, have, we want to have a new kidney and the diabetes people, they want to have uh, 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 beta cells. And there are, there are many people now are working on these concepts in the Netherlands. And we, we are very proud of that, uh, to be part of this consortium. And uh, I think when you look in the, into the future, I think this is, of course, the ultimate solution for kidney patients, so we can forget about all the artificial ones. Um, but in the meantime, I also, also must admit, uh, and I don't know if the last speakers agree with me, but I think this will take a few decades before we have a complete, made your own, from your own stem cells, artificial kidney. Of course, there are steps in between. But before we have reached the point that we can say, okay, you have failed kidneys, we bring you your own new one made from your own new stem cells. I think it will take uh, some decades. So in between, we need to think about dialysis, and that's my motivation also for being involved in dialysis improvements because I think it's a suboptimal treatment, but we, I think we, we're stuck to it for a few decades, uh, so we have to, uh, to improve. And I would like to end uh, with uh, my favorite quote of, of Dr. Kolf, and he said the main aim of, of his endeavors were to restore people to an enjoyable existence. I think that's, that's what it's all about. It's not about removing enough toxins, it's about patients feeling well and uh, patients feeling empowered. So if it's not enjoyable, it should not be done. And um, I would like to thank you for listening. And um, well, if you have questions, I will stay afterwards. And uh, you can also send me an email if you like. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
Yes. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, what the patients think? What the biology mission that they have at home? So do, do, no. So, no. So do the patients pay for the machine that they have at home? That's a good question. Uh, luckily, no. Um, uh, we have a good healthcare system in the Netherlands. And we can afford dialysis for everyone who is needing it. I know that in other countries, this is not always the case. Uh, so in these countries, you barely see home dialysis. Uh, you see other kinds of dialysis, like uh, peritoneal dialysis. We didn't talk about that, but it's not really an artificial kidney. But that's another way of doing dialysis, using your belly. Uh, only a small part of patients are doing that. But, uh, so in these countries, you probably see other kinds of dialysis. Or people die. And so they're, well, I would say there is no end-stage kidney disease because by that time, people have died already. And on this positive note, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we'll uh, give another round of applause for Jasper. I think. Thank you very much. Uh, so I don't envy two following speakers because Jasper introduced quite a few challenges for them to solve. But uh, please welcome Asel and uh, Marlon. So two PhD students from uh, LUMC working on the bioengineered kidneys and uh, transplantation. Success. <laughs> So now it's time to start talking about that future dream that was just mentioned. So I think it's, it has become clear that, that living with dialysis isn't necessarily living, it's surviving. Um, so that's why we want that bio-artificial kidney, why we want to have that develop, developed. And during this presentation, um, I will provide or give three different concepts for bio-artificial kidney that we are working upon at the LUMC at this moment. Um, and my name is Merlon, I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of uh, Nephrology um, working on, on some of these uh, concepts. So, um, because tonight's also about the, the history, two points, so, or one, one general point perhaps, the, the place of Leiden in all of this. So we stand here today on the, the World Kidney Day, the 10th of March, um, and we are sitting or standing here in Leiden. And Leiden is actually the city in which, as we just heard, the dialysis machine was discovered. But Leiden is also the city in the Netherlands in which the first kidney transplantation was performed. And that was actually performed in 1966. So Leiden has a long-standing history with kidney replacement therapies or artificial or alternative uh, therapies for, for patients with end-stage kidney disease. So then there are two points or two discoveries that are important for uh, this presentation and for what's well, the bio-artificial kidney in general. So the discovery of stem cells, and you could look at stem cells as if they are children. So children can still become anything. They can become a teacher, they can become a baker, they could become an IT specialist, but also a doctor or a scientist. And the same applies for stem cells. So a stem cell can still become, an, or a stem cell can become any cell type present within the body. It can become a part of muscle in your foot, it can become part of your heart, it can be part, become part of your brain, but also part of your kidney. And then the, the stem cells in general were discovered quite some time ago, but actually the discovery that spearheaded the field of regenerative medicine was only made in 2006. So the, what we're going to be talking about has actually only ha been happening for a, a relatively brief period of time, especially when you compare it to um, the dialysis machine mentioned earlier, or also the concept of transplantation. Um, so before going into building kidneys, let's just discuss what a kidney is. Um, so a kidney contains a lot of individual functional units, actually one million of these per kidney. And what you see here on the right is a nephron. The nephron is the kidney's functional unit. And the word, the word filtration has already been mentioned a couple of times, and that's actually what happens within the glomerulus of this nephron. Um, so that's the central part, and that's covered by, uh, as well, the, these mechanical artificial uh, kidneys, or the dialysis machines. What's not covered by those is actually the, the, some of the other functions of the kidney. Um, so the reabsorption and the secretion that's performed within the tubular system that comes after the glomerulus. Um, and then the third part of the nephron, so you have the, the glomerulus in which the filtration is performed, the tubular system in which you have the reabsorption and secretion, 
um, and the last part is the collecting ducts in which all the urine is collected. So these three different segments perform the, the function of making urine. They enable us to, to excrete those waste products that we have to excrete. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. And thus, for the rest of the talk, keep in mind we need nephrons to produce urine. We need a vasculature to provide oxygen, to provide nutrients, but also for the filtration, because as was mentioned in the first talk, you need blood, thus you need vessels for filtration. And you need an exit path for the urine, because you need to get rid of it. You need those collecting ducts, or you need the ureter. So the three concepts I will be talking about is on the first, building from scratch, starting with nothing and trying to build it uh, from that. The second is going for major renovations. And the third one with which I will conclude is minor renovations. Um, and Asel will also make that more clear uh, or discuss something that or several parts that are also needed for that. So the build with building from scratch, I mean making mini kidneys, so organoids. The second part will be about whole kidney engineering, so going for a larger scale. Um, and to the third part, I will come towards the end. So first, building kidneys from or building from scratch or building these organoids. So up following the discovery of those stem or induced peripotent stem cells, um, a lot of effort has been put into the development of protocols to make from those stem cells the different cells that are necessary for the kidney. And as I've just shown, the kidney is a complex organ with a lot of individual functional nephrons. And within each nephron, a lot of different cell types are also needed again. So it's quite complex um, to, to integrate and to make it a whole. Um, but then what was interesting is actually that um, upon culturing these, those stem cells and, and um, providing them to, to certain factors, to certain conditions, um, that they tend to organize and tend to self-organize. So what you see if you, you focus in on those uh, mini kidneys to a very small scale, is actually that you see that the different part of the nephrons, so the glomerulus, the tubuli, and the collecting ducts, tend to align to a certain degree. But there are at the moment still several limitations as well to the concept of a mini kidney or a kidney organoid. So they aren't, at, at least at this time, suitable for renal replacement therapy. On the one hand, because of the number of nephrons that they contain, there is no exit path for, for urine, so the urine can't be excreted, um, and there is no active or there is no vasculature that can be actively perfused. So there is no actual filtration when you culture those organoids in the lab. So that's why you have to go, or that's why we're going to the second step. So the major renovations, and for this we actually need a scaffold. So at the top. We still have the stem cells and we still have their differentiation towards a more renal cell type. What's new for this concept is that we take a discarded donor kidney, so a kidney that is not suitable for transplantation anymore. We expose that kidney to a, con or to a, a process called decellularization, and we'll get into that in a second. And following decellularization, uh, you can produce a kidney scaffold. And I will show also on the next slide what the kidney scaffold actually is. But this kidney scaffold you can combine with the cells that you have cultured or the cells that you culture into a sort of bioartificial or bioengineered kidney. So organ decellularization or actually major renovations is like taking out all your furniture out of the kitchen, out of the bathroom and out with, well, perhaps even the walls. Um, so removing all the cells that are present within an organ. And to do that, you can use the organ's vasculature. So here you see an, a normal human kidney. Um, and following, like, or after using that vasculature and after perfusing it with, um, and that's actually with soaps. So not the soap, of course not the soap with which we wash our hands like now, or well, have washed our hands over the past two years. But with soaps, we can actually remove all the cells present within such an organ. Um, and after like, exposing it to the soaps, the next step is to wash all, away all the cell, well, cell remnants and also all the soap parts to, to get more or less a clean or, or clear scaffold. And that's what you see here on the right. So here again, we have the, the normal kidney and the decellularized kidney or the kidney scaffold. And then when you zoom in on those to a very small scale, this is actually what the normal kidney looks like. So there you still see the, the glomerulus, but then when you would look at the decellularized kidney or at the kidney scaffold, it looks as follows. So the structure has remained more or less the same. You can still, still see that glomerular structure, but all the cells are absent. So all the cells have been removed. 
Then the next part is of course to redecorate. Um, we have to put in the well, we have to put back in the walls, the furniture, and everything. So we have to reintroduce the cells into this scaffold. Um, and there are actually different routes to do that. Um, the one that's most commonly reported or used, and the one that we've also most rapidly looked into, is using the vessels that are present within this scaffold. Um, so we can use the artery, we can use the vein, and we can use the ureter. So when you, or, and this is how the decellarized nephron, like schematically, would look like. So here there are no cells present. This is that kidney scaffold. So if you would use the artery to place cells back into it, this is where the cells would end up. So you, you can reach part of the, the nephron. If you would use the vein, they end up in a different part, but they end up in, like, well, here, also part of the nephron. And then if you use the ureter, it's actually a bit more difficult to use that one. Um, to, to get the cells actually into the nephron, uh, but then it would look like more or less like this. So each individual approach doesn't do the trick, as is shown, uh, or as, as has become clear. Um, so it would be looking into the combination of different routes. So what would happen if we would use all routes, so use the artery, the vessel, and the ureter, and what would happen if, for example, we would only use the fasciculature. So if you take all roots, you can repopulate most of the nephron, or at, at least you can repopulate the entire fasciculature. Um, however, what the difficult part is, or where it might go wrong, is the tubular part, or the nephron. So to get the, the cells working on the, uh, or responsible for the reabsorption and responsible for the secretion back into the, their right places within the scaffold. And, well, the, the, fasc the fasciculature part also is well becomes clear from that one, but more or less the entire fasciculature can be, or actually the entire fasciculature can be repopulated within such a kidney scaffold. And that's important to keep in mind for the, the last part that we're getting to. Um, so then there is one difficult thing about this, and this is the number of cells that would actually be needed to repopulate an entire human scale kidney, or actually a human kidney, um, because then you would speak of hundreds of billions of cells. Um, and at the moment, um, it's difficult, or you might even say very difficult, or perhaps even say close to impossible, to culture that many cells, and then also especially to get all those cells to their right locations within such a scaffold um, without clogging up the fasciculature or without uh, having other things go wrong. But for the fasciculature, you would only need an hundred or le like several hundreds of millions of cells. So by far fewer cells. And with that, perhaps more attainable. So summarizing this part, indeed, the ability to generate sufficient cells is, the, well, at the moment, one of the main bottlenecks. Um, and the same for, like, can we get the cells at the right locations? So this is what a, a resulting or such an artificial, bio-artificial kidney would look like at this moment. Um, so on the left side, you can see the, the fasciculature, the arterial fasciculature of it. And on the right side, we have it in an uh, organ chamber that was also shown during the, the previous talk already. Um, but actually, this is an, an oh, oh, I removed that part. But this is, has, or this is a refascularized kidney, so not an, um, an bio-artificial kidney. So it doesn't contain the, the, uh, the, the tubular or the, all the nef nef parts of the nephron, but it contains the entire fasciculature. So the fasciculature has been repopulated. And that's where, we go, or that's where I want to go also with the minor renovations. So suppose you would buy a house and you would only have to redo the floor and paint the, the walls. Um, or at least it, it minor, but it might be a bit more difficult than just minor. And that, that's actually where the project of the refurbished donor kidney comes in. Um, and this is how that can be efficient. So each organ has, or well, each tissue has fasciculature, and fasciculature has an inner lining, and that inner lining is built of a certain cell type. And upon transplantation, and we haven't talked about transplantation that much yet, but the cell will talk more about that in a minute. Um, upon transplantation, that, that inner lining is first and foremost exposed to the uh, blood of the, the receiver of that organ and thus in, exposed to the immune system of that, that receiver. So the, the idea here, or the concept here, is to remove those cells from the, uh, from the donor of the organ and replace those cells with the cells of the proposed recipient. And thus, through that, make it into a personalized bioengineered kidney. Um, and with that, you, because it, it appears, or it seems to be possible to, to 
actually target that fasciculature and to, to replace that fasciculature, uh, at least in a decellarized bio or a scaffold, uh, kidney uh, scaffold. Um, and then the next step for that would be to, to move that into discard or move that towards donor organ. So to see if we can, whilst preserving an organ outside of the body, replace uh, it with the, those uh, cells from the, the proposed recipients. Um, and in a minute, a cell will go into the, the keeping it alive outside of the body. Um, and for now, I would like to conclude with um, actually a, a number of, of headlines from, from different uh, studies from, from other groups, um, which actually highlights that the field is also shifting towards these, uh, towards using organs as they are or to using donor organs and looking at how can we improve them or how can we personalize them, how can we regenerate them. Because it has turned out over the past 15 years of research into um, this uh, bioartificial kidney or into regenerative medicine for, uh, as, as directive for, for kidney uh, failure, that it is actually quite difficult to, to actually harness nature. So to use nature on that as well. Um, and that's where I would like to, well, and, yeah, and this is a mini summary in between, but that's where I would like to give it uh, to myself. All right, thank you very much. Uh, for the brief uh, cliffhangers that I can uh, continue on. Can someone help me out? Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Need to come by. <laughs> that works exactly. All right. Thank you for the introduction. It feels surreal to be in front of a real audience again. My name is Asel Arkbaiva. I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Surgery in the Leiden University Medical Center. And to go uh, full circle, starting off with a machine, I'm going to continue on also focusing on machine, in this case, machine perfusion used in kidney transplantation, whether it is hot or not. As we have learned today, uh, dialysis is a method for renal replacement therapy. However, it can be very cumbersome for patients. So currently, the preferred treatment for that would be still kidney transplantation. The first successful kidney transplantation was already performed almost 70 years ago in uh, the United States and briefly afterwards this has also then uh, come to the Netherlands and since then it has evolved and developed into even a global international exchange of donor kidneys and other organs. However, the biggest challenge with this renal replacement therapy that is uh, organ transplantation is of course the availability of these kidneys. These are scarce and um, the increasing disparity, of course, causes this to be uh, less uh, as an accessible method for uh, kidney transplantation. So currently in the Eurotransplant region, which is, uh, includes eight countries in which, uh, kidney, uh, in which uh, donor organs are, uh, can be interchanged, uh, currently already uh, in the past year, uh, uh, even at the end of the year, there were still almost 10,000 patients still on the waiting list for a kidney, even though in the same year, almost 3,000 kidneys were transplanted from uh, diseased donors, meaning donors after brain or cardiac death. So you can imagine the growing disparity, um, meaning that the need for available, better available kidneys is growing. So how does this process entail? It starts, of course, with the donor. And afterwards, a whole process is, uh, is started in which matching, um, uh, finding the uh, uh, best, of, best uh, matched uh, recipient on the waiting list, but also then, of course, the logistical challenge of transporting the organ to the recipient and getting the uh, whole medical uh, team um, ready for this. In this uh, whole process, Time and quality assessment of an organ are crucial. They define whether, uh, to what extent, the uh, eventual transplantation will be successful. So, of course, to gain more time to be better able to assess the uh, organ, 
the biggest question that we want to answer is whether we should or should not transplant an organ, whether we should or not transplant this kidney. As mentioned, because the demand is higher than the supply, I think there are two methods that we can apply to uh, tackle this uh, challenge. And that is initially starting with the donor pool that is available to see if we can improve that quality, if we can improve the assessment of these kidneys to see whether they're suitable for transplantation. But also not only uh, stick with the current available kidneys, but also to see how we can expand this donor pool. For example, the kidneys which are deemed already untransplantable at the moment, whether they could still be maybe refurbished and uh, then eventually transplanted. For this, I propose one of the solutions that could be applied, which is machine perfusion. So the first image we usually have of organ transplantation is an organ in a box. And that is because once it has to be transported, what we do is we put the organ on uh, cold storage. That means to reduce the uh, metabolism in the organ so it won't uh, deteriorate once it's outside of the body. Uh, we use uh, uh, temperature, colder temperatures to preserve that quality. However, this is not currently the standard anymore. Uh, so meaning the flushing of the kidney and then putting it on the ice. Currently, a machine has been developed, which we call hypothermic machine perfusion, including uh, a device with a pump, which circulates then a preservation solution through the organ, allowing us then uh, fully to um, uh, preserve the kidney still in cold temperatures, however, with also the potential to add dissolved oxygen and um, uh, maintaining a circulation in this organ. This is shown to be in a short outcome after transplantation to be better than the cold storage and has been recently uh, set as clinical practice, as clinical standard practice in the Netherlands. So all donor kidneys which are retrieved uh, from disease donors are transported on hypothermic machine perfusion, which looks like this device. So however, we are still maintaining cold uh, temperatures and whilst the kidney is outside of the body and is uh, stored on ice, it becomes a black box. We cannot really assess to what extent uh, the, the quality of the kidney is at that moment. So moving on to warmer temperatures could however give us an indication to how the kidney would function as it would in our body at body temperature 37 degrees. Hence we call this technique normothermic machine perfusion. And as uh, the first speaker mentioned, the device has come on wheels, so they have thought about it. So how does this work? So machine perfusion, it starts a perfusion, meaning it has a pump which uh, then starts a circulation, allowing the perfusion solution to go uh, past an oxygenator first, which then allows us to uh, add oxygen to the, eventually um, to the system which passes eventually through the kidney. Then it passes a heater, allowing it to warm up the system, the circulation up to 37 degrees. And then of course, eventually to the access point of the kidney, um, attached to the vasculature, passing through the kidney. And as I mentioned, we try to imitate the physiological conditions of the body, which means even on this device then, on normal thermic machine perfusions, the kidney could produce urine. So once uh, the outflow is collected, it's then returned um, which, in which we can still also then add uh, nutrients and other uh, supplements that usually otherwise would also come, of course, uh, from your body. So, as I mentioned briefly to summarize, this technique then, um, also once the kidney is out of the body, could be used as a preservation technique, hopefully also allowing us to better assess the kidney whilst it's real time in front of you on this normal thermic machine device but also could maybe create a platform in which we can recondition or refurbish the organ. So currently, um, this technique has been applied for very short-term uh, preservation for one hour and two hours. It has been shown to be safe, feasible, and has improved the early functions. Of course, now the challenge is how uh, much can we extend and uh, whether prolonged organ preservation of these kidneys is possible. So for this, Currently in the uh, LEMC, we're conducting a clinical study uh, called the proper, uh, PROPER study, which stands for prolonged perfusion, actually also sponsored by the Dutch Kidney Foundation, in which 
uh, once the kidneys are retrieved and transported to the hospital uh, of the recipient for transplantation, after preparation of the organ, it will be first placed on the normal thermic machine perfusion before it's then transplanted. We have developed this um, uh, protocol, this technique, by using kidneys deemed untransplantable and afterwards then uh, uh, currently we are uh, including patients for this trial by gradually increasing the perfusion, uh, starting with an, uh, one hour to see if we can extend that up to six hours of normal thermic machine perfusion. Uh, we're conducting this study also in collaboration with Groningen um, um, to, uh, and include and are still currently um, including uh, patients for the study. Anecdotally, we almost had an inclusion today and I almost missed out on this talk because otherwise I had to uh, attend this uh, procedure. Um, so how does it look like? This is how it's, um, uh, for example, how it looks like in the center in Groningen. We have a dedicated OR, or the operating theater. Here you can see actually the uh, hypothermic machine device. So it, the kidney had just been taken off the surgical team are preparing the organ, and here you can actually see the normal thermic machine perfusion device being set up and prepared. So once the kidney is then prepared and the device is set up, uh, an example of a uh, picture in our center, once the kidney is then uh, laced in its cradle, attached to the perfusion system, it can be preserved uh, for several hours now uh, using normal thermic machine perfusion. But we do not only want a preservation system, Eventually, of course, we want to be able to make these kidneys even better to also then um, uh, make uh, the transplantation more successful. And that is, uh, with this technique, also a ben benefit uh, as it could include a therapeutic uh, potential whilst the kidney is outside of the body and before it goes into the recipient. One of the benefits is you can target the therapy very much only on the kidney and the delivery of the therapy could be very local um, meaning that you can, of course, thereby reach the kidney. However, also not exposing other therapies to the recipients, which occasionally could also be harmful. So what has currently uh, been explored? So using pharmacological agents, for example, um, uh, sugar-regulating uh, drugs can be added during this perfusion. Also, as already briefly mentioned, using stem cells, for example, as a cell therapy, which could have regenerative uh, potential, could then be also infused during this perfusion, uh, hopefully there uh, by creating a regenerative capacity within the kidney graft. Gene therapy, for example, are, is being explored and also um, other therapies to prime the organ for the surgery, such as anticoagulant therapies are uh, currently being studied. So to generally summarize also what uh, Marlon has introduced to you, of course, uh, being able to preserve a kidney at the moment, for example, for uh, not only uh, several hours, days, but maybe even weeks, could then allow us to then maybe even scaffolds, maybe current available kidney organs to then uh, um, perform interventions to see if uh, we can actually then uh, increase then the available donor pool of kidneys and uh, whether maybe that uh, could be also a step forward to personalizing this kidney graft. So just to briefly summarize, with the potential of the uh, organoids, the scaffolds, um, and also then a platform, for example, organ perfusion for assessment and preservation, uh, we are looking into more and hopefully uh, with, this, with these steps getting a bit closer to a personalized donor kidney, um, which could be the, uh, which hopefully will lead us uh, to better developments in the future for renal replacement therapy. So just uh, to thank not only our, of course, our collaborating teams, but mainly also the donors who have, uh, and their families who have made their organs available, not only for transplantation, but also for research. I'd like to thank our collaborating centers in Groningen, Rotterdam, and of course, uh, in the LUMC. So uh, I think to conclude, let's uh, get some drinks and get the kidneys working. Thank you very much. Yes. Many thanks, uh, Salon Merlon. But before we go to have drinks and some snacks, oh, uh, let's uh, do some questions because I'm sure there are questions. Yes, please. Uh, 
Uh, hi, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really interesting and really interesting research that you're doing, both of you. I want to ask about the uh, whole kidney and engineering strategy, and maybe both of you can answer this question. Does a stem cell that the patient is going to use to recoculate this kidney come from the stem the patient itself, or from another patient, or can come from the patient who's going to use them? And then, does those stem cells reach their final phase before they go into the kidney and repopulate it, or after they go into the kidney? So I'm trying to summarize it. So the question is about. <laughs> so the question was about the um, whole kidney gen bio bioengineering, yes. and then the question is about the stem cells. So the stem cells that the patient is going to use come from that patient. So, from so, so the, the origin of the stem cells, yes. and then the timing when you use them, right? Or yeah, and then when they uh, are differentiated finally to their final development level. Okay, so the, so the where, where it, okay, so when stem cells are used for kidney bioengineering, where do they come from? So what's the origin, and uh, uh, how does differentiation take place? So in when and where? Yeah. So if you are trying to make a kidney, so trying to make an art bioartificial kidney, um, of course, what you would want to make mo or like would. would like to achieve is, is a personalized bioartificial kidney. Um, so to that end, uh, or that, that limits the, the pools of where you would take those uh, stem cells from. Um, and ideally, you would like take them from the person whom you intend to transplant uh, uh, the, the kidney then to. Um, alternatively, um, you might also look at um, hypoimmunogenic um, stem cell lines that can be differentiated into the different uh, uh, kidney cell, uh, 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 renal cell types. Um, so that's then the first question. And the second was uh, when to introduce the cells or which yeah, so stage of differentiation to take. Uh, um, th that the first, and there are different. So there is no one ideal approach. So you could either um, uh, aim more towards like going to more t towards more like um, renal end stage renal or well end renal cell type you could also aim more towards like taking a more towards a progenitor uh, cell type and go for the differentiation uh, within the kidney scaffold um, but actually that's something that hasn't been um, uh, investigated that much uh, given also the, the different difficulties with cell numbers and and those uh, kind of aspects thank you very much. yeah thanks uh, okay very very quick one promising techniques, but I think you also mentioned this might still be a couple of decades from uh, getting to the patient, and you, I think, uh, what you're talking about is much closer to uh, being valuable for uh, the patient now, but I think even if all this would uh, work, it would, it would still not solve the uh, limited number of uh, 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 donor uh, kidneys. Nobody talks about fake kidneys. Now, with we're definitely not, not there yet either, but I would happily argue that um, it's not further from the patient than anything else that has been discussed at, uh, at the moment. What do you think? Is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> So the, the question is what, what we think about xenotransplantation. Sorry, uh, I will just quickly uh, repeat the question. So the question was about xenotransplantation yeah. and the, 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 the animal kidneys. And speed with uh, which that uh, uh, could get to the patient compared to all the, to all the other things we've been Exactly. So uh, how much maybe, maybe it's more feasible, a more feasible approach. And uh, yeah, so what do the speakers think about that? I think the main thing for xenotransplantation is at the moment that we don't accept as a country to transplant porcine organs into humans. So um, in the end, that won't be a feasible approach if that doesn't change. Um, and I mean, opinions are changing at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's even un it, it's just as unknown whether it will be. Uh, Sorry, can, can, we, can, we, can we go on into this discussion with the drinks? But uh, <laughs> I think it's a very relevant topic. Uh, just, uh, can just I just be make a comment? Yesterday in the Dutch news was that the, yeah. actually the person was transplanted with a pig heart and it died. Uh, so I think you 
I think you, did a lot you better. You ran than, into serious also biosafety issues. Uh, and, of, and of course, but I think you also did a lot better than the one that you went to. Okay, so just to uh, try to get over. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it uh, sounds like a very good. Uh, so let's do another round of applause. <laughs> And we would like to thank all the speakers and uh, present them with uh, bottles of wine each. Uh, and... Oh, right, yeah. Um, let me just put this down. Uh, everybody of you uh, got two tokens, as supposedly was these. If you didn't get them, um, uh, uh, go to Fleur, you'll, you'll get them. Uh, there to get drinks at the bar. Um, very important, of course. So I think we're all, uh, after all this uh, input uh, for the brain, we get some input for the... For the stomachs, right? <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening and um, let's continue the discussions at, during drinks.